And I think we are, no, we are sharing the wrong screen, I think. We need to be sharing that screen. Perfect. And then we need to start recording. Oh, we are recording. Perfect. Mitch can edit that. Thanks, Mitchell. Love you, Mitchell. Okay. So uh, we'll quickly recap this. Oh, Lockie, how are you going with it? You, is it making sense? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just driving. So I'm just listening at the moment. No worries. Yeah. Keep listening. Don't talk. Just drive. <laughs> All right. So we understand now that um, movement, it can't help but leave hints. It likes to be caught out misbehaving so that we can improve it. But when our egos get in the way, that becomes our biggest roadblock is when, you know, we can see ways to help someone improve their squat and they aren't interested in it. And that's fine. You know, not everyone will be. We create spaces by making ourselves better movers uh, and the people that do want to work with us better movers. And then before you know it, People come and they want to get better. And that's cool. All right. So let's recap the knee. So I'm going to move this bad boy over again so we can see. All righty. So we've got the knee complex. So it's made up of two major bones, right? It's made up of the femur, which is here, and the tibia, which is here. And both have that relationship that's dependent on where the femur is relative to the ground and whether or not the foot is touching the ground. This relationship with the ankle complex means we can tie the two together and call them lower limb control zone two or LL2. And it is the furthest from the pillar. So we are looking at here to here. That is your lower limb control zone two right there. It's your knee complex and your ankle complex and how they synergize with each other. Essentially, I like to couple. So when I'm assessing, I'm assessing lower limb two or LLC two. I will be referring to someone's ankle complex, their ability to dorsiflex, plantar flex, big toe extend, and tibiofemoral rotate. Uh, and when I can write those down on a piece of paper, I've just done lower limb two, and I've got all the data I need, and that takes me less than a minute. And that's really powerful information that you can get. Remember, we don't measure inversion eversion, we watch inversion eversion. Uh, and then we measure dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, big toe extension, and uh, internal ro external rotation of the um, tibiofemoral joint. Now, knee complex ranges. Uh, flexion is a little challenging, and I'm going to tell you why. So flexion in a hip extended position, typically one fist. So it could be yours or it could be the client's, doesn't matter. One fist away from their heel to their butt. The reason this is so hard to measure is because thigh muscle or thigh bulk can inhibit somebody's ability to access knee flexion, but it doesn't make their ability to access a pattern bad because the movement will occur with muscles rather than trying to move around muscles that are just bulky. The same thing with knee, uh, with knee flexion in a hip flexed position, one fist from heel to butt. All we are trying to do with flexion is typically assess the quality of tissue across the knee and the hip. So we're looking at anterior tissue quality. However, with extension, we can measure zero to 10 degrees in an open or a, cho a closed chain um, pattern. It's easy to do this in an open chain, but this one is good just for clearing any hyper hypermobility. So we want to catch this early. Um, and then tibial internal rotation is that seated. Um, so this position here, and then we're just asking them to windshield wiper their foot inside and outside without the thigh moving, the femur moving, and without their toes lifting off the ground. I intend to have videos for all these, but as, as well, like I said, I'm going to be coming up to Ballarat on the first weekend of um, July and then every couple of weekends. Uh, and I'll be in Frankston for anyone that's in Frankston and I can run you guys through this anytime uh, in the garage or when I'm up in Ballarat. It's important to see this and then understand how you can um, put this into your practice. And if you want a more in-depth look at this, I learned a lot of this from the Selective Functional Movement Assessment through FMS, which was very a very powerful eye-opening experience for me uh, in terms of making movement a little bit more um, nitpicky, which I like. 
Okay, so we recap here. Um, we've got our lower, lower, lower limb or our LL2, lower limb control zone two. Um, now, LL2 is important because it dictates function throughout the entire chain, literally the entryway for force entering through the body. Now, um, we got the three different images here. So we've got our um, uh, standing seated and single leg. So we've got the different images, different positions, but the anatomy doesn't change. We still have the same bones, we still have the same muscles, same ligaments, same tendons. It's just movement mechanics have changed. They're in different positions relative to the foot or the ground and the hip. And that's all we're trying to do is just assess whether or not we are in an open chain or closed chain environment and how we are um, implicating specific joints or specific control zones throughout that pattern. If you're in a deep end range of a squat, and you have an assessed tibiofemoral function, you could be missing easy gains that you've just wasted eight weeks blasting yourself in a, in a squat program over, when all you might need it to do was just unlock your popliteal muscle and all of a sudden, hey, you've got more internal rotation to access hip external rotation. It's something, sometimes it's that easy and people don't believe me until I show them. All right, we're moving into the hip. The hip isn't scary at all. In fact, the hip's super easy. So we move into the hip, if this picture looks familiar, this is essentially what I took from the pillar way back when. All you have to do is just blot out the pelvis because the pelvic girdle only houses the femur, but the pelvic girdle actually doesn't do much moving. So when we talk about hip flexion, hip extension, abduction, abduction, external, internal rotation, circumduction, it happens from here. And it's very important to note that ball and socket joint and also the way that the, the the socket so the hip socket is facing towards us slightly so if we were to take that ball out we'd be able to see the shallow recess or it's actually quite deep but the recess face of the hip from the front but if we were to go around to the back of the hip and pop the joint out we wouldn't be able to see the face the inside face of the hip from the back so the, the hip socket is slightly facing forward. It's on a 30 degree, a 30 degree from lateral, slightly anterior facing direction. Very important to understand for the next couple of uh, slides. So our leg bones here are what we're gonna be focusing on. They're our big movers and shakers when it comes to lower body power and control of force. And they're often overlooked because this, this whole complex gets um, a little bit misrepresented. Okay. So let's look at hip flexion, abduction, and external rotation. I've coupled them together. The femur is a ball and socket joint. This fact hints to its function in more ways than we know on the surface. I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna really quickly tell you why this is important to consider. We see the world in two dimensions, even though we know it's a three-dimensional world. I have a sphere here, and it doesn't matter which way I spin it, you'll only ever see a circle, okay? When we look at movement, we're seeing movement in a two-dimensional pattern, but the movement is happening in three dimensions. So our nervous system interprets our own movement as a three-dimensional movement puzzle. But when we coach, we have a tendency to get locked down in two-dimensional thinking. When we look in an anatomy book, we see flexion happens in a straight line, abduction happens in a straight line, external rotation happens in this line, it all happens together, it's all coupled. And that is part of 3D movement. And it's very important to understand this principle because we can't get bogged down in 2D thinking. Otherwise this principle or this, this lesson won't land at all. So we have to think outside the box here. We see in 2D, but we move in 3D. So we have to start thinking in 3D, particularly when we coach. So we know ball and socket. Um, from this front side diagonal view, so we've slightly tilted the pelvis. From this front side diagonal view, we can see that, that as the femur moves forward into flexion, so I've flexed my femur, I've lifted my knee, the ball within the pelvis is also externally rotating. Let's take it back. Bang. There's the top of the femur. Bang. Now the top of the femur is facing this way. Let's go back. It's facing straight up. Now it's facing out. 
because the hip is externally rotating as the femur flexes. Flexion and external rotation are coupled. You don't see it because you only see movement in 2D and we are a, a big skin suit filled with sticks and pudding. You aren't gonna be able to see what's happening at the hip. Just understand that the way that it's designed is that when it flexes, it's also externally rotating. This comes back to our principle on flexibility. If you don't have flexibility around the hip and you try to flex your hip and you run out of flexibility at your external or internal rotation, that's gonna create some problems. Um, okay, as it does this, the femur moves away from the midline relative to the fixed foot and tibia below. Thus, the femur is also abducting away from the midline. So if we were to take it back in a straight line, as we externally rotate the femur, if I wanna keep moving in flexion, I have to move this femur away from my midline. So this knee, while it is in front of me, will start to travel away from my other knee to create an open hip position relative to a fixed foot and tibia. If I'm missing internal rotation at the tibia, I will spin the foot as Michelle rightly pointed out. In an open chain, we can manage the direction of force by main maintaining the femur's translation to the midline. This is an important un to understand as well. Meaning we can move the femur forward without the lateral drift into abduction. So if you were to stand on one leg and lift your leg and keep it in a straight line, you can mitigate the abduction, but you are still flexing and you are still externally rotating within the socket. This is particularly important for straight line force production like sprinting, where we are trying to minimize the deviation away from straight line force production as much as possible because force loves straight lines. If we are externally rotating and abducting when we sprint, then we're going to have to pull that leg back into the midline to create extension. And that's wasted energy. That's force bleed, which we talked about in last week's webinar on the pillar. That's force bleed. When we are deviating away from straight line force, that's force bleed. In a closed chain, however, a squat or a split squat, this method is just not feasible. Due to the fixed nature of the foot and the tibia, the femur just not, does not have the room to move purely in a straight line going forward. So that's what we just talked about, right? Fixed foot, fixed tibia, it has to have something to rotate on, otherwise the foot rotates out. When we have rotation through the lower control zone, lower, lower limb two, then the femur now has something to externally rotate and abduct against when we move through our hip flexion moment. And so it will couple the external rotation occurring at the hip socket with abduction of the femur away from the midline, creating our rotation relative to the fixed tibia, relative to the ankle complex, relative to the floor, where we produce power or force. This rotation cannot occur if the tibiofemoral joint is lacking the reciprocal internal rotation in an open chain that we can assess really easily. Michelle picked it. Good job, Michelle. This slide is super easy. It's the opposite. The hip is so easy. Hip extension, adduction, and internal rotation. The exact opposite is true for our femur as it moves into extension. The shape of the forward facing socket creates a natural internal rotation of the femur as it moves its way into hip extension. I'm gonna pause it there, let's go back. So we look at this hip, remember that it's forward facing. As my hip moves into extension, it is now going to rotate the other way. And as it does, the front side of my femur will start to twist in so I will be internally rotating and I will be drifting towards the midline. I will be adducting. Hip extension, adduction, and internal rotation are coupled. You need them, particularly if you wanna run fast or lift heavy. As a result, in order for our body to maintain center of mass over the foot within the frontal plane, the f because, let's go back, frontal plane now, we need to be able to maintain the midline over the in the frontal plane because we're on one leg, not in the sagittal plane. The femur must adduct towards the midline, or rather, if the femur is fixed in a closed chain position, when would the femur be fixed in a closed chain position in an extended, adducted, and internally rotated position? Someone throw it at me.
You say again, sorry. Yep. When would the femur be fixed in a closed chain position when we are in an extended, ab adducted, adducted, and internal rotated position? Closed chain. Let's take this position, tilt it forwards 45 degrees. So when we are running, no, when we're running, oh, like, yeah, back. This hip will be in a closed chain hip extension, adduction, and internal rotation moment. If you're missing anything, if you're missing extension, if you're missing adduction, if you're missing internal rotation, there'll be compensation that occurs at the pelvis or at the, knee, or at the ankle complex. And that will create on the opposite side, force bleed, because you'll have to create a force to stabilize against the lack of stability you have here. Plus you'll have to create a force to drive your next step into the ground. Just changing the way we think about movement. So if the femur is fixed in a closed chain position, the femur will propel our center of mass forward and maintain a midline position with our other leg throughout the gait cycle. We'll go over that one more time. As a result, in order for our body to maintain a center of mass over the foot within the frontal plane, the femur must adduct towards the midline. So if we are standing in a single leg position, we will shift our weight via our femur so that our midline moves closer to our femur. We are adducting the hip so that we can stay over the foot in the frontal plane. But when we are running, we aren't adducting our, um, our body because then we'd be doing this. Instead, we are using reciprocal extension and uh, internal rotation and moments of adduction to create a straight line um, midline position because force likes moving in straight lines, I'm told. Now, as was true with webinar two, when you are missing the crucial pieces of mobility within the puzzle, that is movement patterns. It's certainly not the end of the world, but if you want to unlock free, ready to be accessed force production for people looking to squeeze more juice out of the performance fruit, it's hard to spot a deficit and walk past it. And this is why I'm picky. And you can choose not to be picky and still do really well as a coach or a therapist, but I am super picky because if I'm picky about movement when it doesn't matter, I'm not gonna miss it when it does matter. I'm gonna say that again. If I'm picky about movement when it doesn't matter, I'm never gonna miss a deficit when it absolutely does matter. And I don't care if you're the best in the world or the worst. If I come along and pick a movement deficit, when you tell me that this is the best athlete in the world and I pick a movement deficit that's really easy to fix, it may or may not make them better, but if it's something that we can chuck in a program that only adds 5% yield, but doesn't take anything away. If it's something as simple as, let's just spend an extra five minutes across an hour working on some hip extension drills. If you can't tell me with a straight face that it's not worth doing that and it's just worth lifting them or running them or putting them through plyos, then I would argue that your program isn't worth the paper it's written on. Because if you're picky about movement, when it doesn't matter, you will catch it when it does. And it's the moments that you catch it when someone comes to you and they have chronic hip pain and they're worried about going in for surgery because they've been told they've got a femoroacetabular impingement, which is an impingement in here, in your femoroacetabular joint. And a surgeon loves to go in there and clean that out. And then you never have the same range there again. When you're a 23 year old female footballer and you come to me and say, I've been and seen three physios and a sports surgeon. They want to cut me open. And then me, a lowly diploma of remedial massage and cert three and four personal training comes along and says, you don't have an FAI because I just proved you don't have an FAI. You have a pelvic, pelvic instability where you are stuck in anterior pelvic tilt and you're running into the front of your pelvis. You could develop into one, but we can work out of that. And I take your chronic pain away in less than 10 minutes because my assessments are pretty, pretty strong. I take your pain away and then we get you moving really well and you go back and you play for uh, Box Hill Hawthorne. I still won't mention her name. And then she wins a grand final. I get a say in this stuff. When you are picky about movement, 
when it doesn't matter, you will pick it up when it does. And you may save a girl who's 23 years old from a surgeon's knife when she doesn't need the surgery. And then she can go on and do the things that she loves doing, playing sport and be a contributing factor to winning a grand final for a football team. That's why being picky with movement is important. Understanding these principles when it comes to movement is also very important. Let's go over the hip complex. Let me move this bad boy over here. So we've got the hip and knee complexes that they work together and they make up lower limb control zone one or LLC one, or you can just say LL one if you want, lower limb one. So a lack of mobility or control through this region can have consequences on function above and below. As this complex is that last stop before the pillar, bang, there's the pillar. It's right there. That's, that's stage one of the pillar, piece one from the ground up, pelvic girdle. As this complex is the last stop before the pillar, it's a great investment within a program to ensure ranges of motion are known, measured, and managed throughout a program. Let's go through them. Hip complex ranges. Flexion with a single leg. We're looking for 70 degrees minimum. So that's an active straight leg raise, 70 degrees minimum before non-moving parts start moving. So if you want to pause this video, if you're watching it after the fact, or if you guys want to stop after this video and jump on the floor, you can measure this, lay on the floor, be honest with yourself, lift one leg, stop moving that leg when either your torso wants to get involved in a flexion moment or when your other leg wants to get involved by lifting off the ground. Because as soon as a non-moving part starts moving, bang, you're out of range. It's really easy to measure. Single leg, active straight leg raise, 70 degrees. This isn't measuring the ability of uh, the mobility of flexion in that leg. This is measuring your ability to flex a leg against a hip that remains in extension. So the leg that stays on the floor, has it got enough extension to allow you to express single leg flexion to 70 degrees? If it doesn't, we've got something that we can work on. Free gains. Bilateral flexion, we need 120 degrees. Extension, zero to 10. There's a specific assessment that I use and I learned from my mentor and colleague, Greg Day. Uh, it's also in the SFMA, it's called a Faber test. And again, I'm gonna show you guys this stuff when we catch up in Ballarat or in Frankston. Um, this is a two for one test because it assesses hip health and it's what I used to assess this person's FAI. Um, this, is a, this, this test takes a hip and moves it into flexion, abduction and external rotation and it crosses the foot over onto the opposite knee. And then you just drop this thigh, this femur, out into external rotation abduction. And what that does is it puts stress on the front of this capsule here. And when someone has an FAI, a true FAI, they're actually running the neck of their femur, this bad boy here. They're running the neck of their femur, bang, into that, into the rim, the lip of their pelvis. They're not hitting bone, they're hitting cartilage. So they're hitting the lip, which holds the head of this um, femur in. And they're chewing it up. So there's a test that allows you to test, not only does this person have the ability to get into extension at zero degrees, but do they have a healthy hip? This person came to me with pain in her hip. She presented with a positive finding with a Faber's test, but then when I allowed her to apply stability through her upper body, so I allowed her to align her pillar by just asking her to, she was laying on a table and her arms were above her chest and she just pushed down against my hands. So I just said, don't let me push you, pushed against her hands. That resulted in her anterior chain accepting load and it realigned her pelvis, her spine, her ribs, and her shoulder girdle. So it realigned her pillar and it took her pain away. So that proved that she didn't have a medical problem and they were gonna go in and cut her open. I'm glad I did the test. She didn't have hip extension though. And that was where we started. Gave her some hip extension, took her pain away. 10 minutes, best $90 she ever spent. External rotation. In a hip flex position, so supine, you can get 30 to 40 degrees minimum. If you don't have it, you should get it because it's going to affect your ability if we're in hip flexion, it's going to affect your ability to access external rotation and abduction. Better believe it will. External rotation in a hip extended position, you'll be prone. So you'll be on your tummy, 40 degrees minimum. There'll be variations. Internal rotation, hip flexion, supine. So on your back, 30 to 40 degrees. This is also a provocative test for people with hip pain or hip impingement. And then internal rotation, hip extension, prone. So on their tummy, 30, 40 degrees minimum. Again, there'll be variation. There are um, congenital or orthopedic 
conditions that occur at the hip, as is conditions that occur at the spine, the shoulder, the foot. So if you're uh, wanting to get clinically minded, then there are things that you can become aware of. And if not, then you can always refer out if you're unsure. Now, here's a note. I haven't mentioned anything about adduction or abduction in terms of measuring those ranges. Um, it's as true with the ankle as it is with the, the knee and the hip. So there'll be places that require higher levels of, of a coach or a clinician's coordination to measure. Um, like inversion, eversion has an axis of rotation that's just too hard. Thoracic spine can be quite challenging. Lumbar spine can be quite challenging to measure rotation or lateral flexion. So if these are areas that you want to upskill in, by all means, go for it. But before you do go and upskill in them, start to learn these ranges really, really well. Get your hands on a clinometer or download a clinometer on your phone. Learn to measure these ranges and get really familiar with LL1 and LL2 so that you're, when you go and learn these more complex um, assessments, you've got a great foundation of, of hand-eye coordination and, and body control when it comes to the more complex assessments. I'd argue that adduction and abduction are absolutely important to consider, but they're also coupled with hip flexion and extension and external and internal rotation. If we take it back, if I don't measure your abduction, but I do measure your hip flexion and external rotation, and I find both your flexion is fine and your external rotation is fine and your hip extension is fine, but you can't access this pattern, well, then I've just nailed it that you probably don't have abduction. So it's just ruling stuff out trial by fire, like just error, trial and error. So let's go and explore why you don't have abduction. Now I can do some passive work. If I have to go back and take those steps, that's fine. But that'd be such a rare occurrence because they're also coupled together. And again, there's, there's tests that are built in to this system, like this Faber test that I'm gonna show you guys, where it asks you to show me if you've got available abduction because I wanna see if you can get into extension. So I'm gonna pick up abduction in that test anyway. And if you don't have abduction, I'm not gonna expect you to have adduction either because of the principle of flexibility in terms of length and tension of tissues at a hip joint. So if we're lacking in a hip joint in one range, remember three dimensions, then we're probably going to be either lacking or we're going to be compensating on the other side of that hip somewhere. So it's just trying, trying to change the way we think about movement. If we find a problem, if it smells like a dog, it's probably a dog. If we find a problem, we fix it. We see what it does to the movement patterns. Same for external rotation and internal rotation. These are quite easy to measure once you get the feel of it and the hang of it. And you can do this on yourself, you can do this on partners, you can do it on your clients. Don't just measure it if you just want to measure it for the sake of it, because sometimes clients want to see what the point of measuring it was. Measure it if you're interested in changing it. And if you're interested in changing it, come up with interesting ways to determine whether or not it's a joint or whether or not it's a, it's a tissue. Again, there are courses that you can do that will help you navigate those um, hurdles, those obstacles, but these are just ways for you to change the way that you think about movement. This is LL2, uh, LL1, I beg your pardon, lower limb control zone one, closer to the spine. So we're understanding, this is all this is, we're just understanding the natural couplings that occur at these joints. When you understand these natural couplings, and they occur everywhere, when you understand it, you'll start to see that big toe extension plays a role in hip extension through gait cycle. Big toe extension also plays a role through the opposing side when you're trying to run and you've got to use both legs to do it. If you can't extend your hip on one side, you'll be anteriorly tilting your pelvis, which will close the front side of your pelvis down and you will lose the ability to flex the other side because you'll run out of range. So big toe extension might be the thing that's holding someone back from expressing all of their power when they sprint. And yet they've got to go and do strength training because the strength coach tells them that they've got to improve their lower body power. And then big dumb Cam Elliott comes along and says, this person has no big toe extension on one side. They've got a bunion or they've got an ingrown toenail and you've got them squatting. Has anyone thought to consider this health problem that this person might have? Just different ways to think about it. Let's get this out of the way. Get that bloody bugger out of the way. All right, I'm going to, so this is essentially the lower limb um, 
slides. The upper limb slides, again, I, as I said, I've had, to, I've had to cut this in two pieces as well because of the recap, but the next one won't take half as long, which is good. But here's what I'll leave you with, with the lower limb. Um, so we understand these couples and stuff, but just understand that if you don't have the positions, it doesn't mean we stop squatting or deadlifting. It doesn't mean we stop running. What it means is that we've got a handbrake on, but you can still drive the car. Just understand that you've got a handbrake on. So we want to work to build programs to help remove handbrakes and manage movement better in the gym so that we can do it on the field. We can do it in the sport that we want to do or the hobbies that we want to do. If you can't do it in an open chain, don't expect to be able to do it in a closed chain when it comes to movement patterns. Let's flip it on its head. If you can't do it in an enclosed environment like the gym, don't expect to be able to transfer it into an open environment like the field. That's just lazy. If we sit there and just say he got stronger because he's lifting more weight, he must be a better footballer now. That's just lazy. If you can't do it in an open chain, don't expect to be able to do it in a closed. If you can't do it in a closed environment, don't expect to be able to do it in an open environment. That's just how it works. If you can't load it in the weight room, how on earth do you expect it to carry over to the field? Like, will they get stronger? Yes, objectively, they'll get stronger. But if you're happy arguing the point over a half-assed adaptation, then again, I, I feel like we're not being picky enough about movement. And, you know, it comes down to what, whether or not you want to split the hairs. I like splitting the hairs because I like to be picky. Um, and I like building really movement rich programs. And I also like lifting heavy. I like getting sweaty. I like building aerobic uh, energy systems and anaerobic energy systems. But if you can't move in a position, you're working harder than you need to. That's crazy talk. All right, bang. Next will be lower limb, I mean, upper limb one and two, I promise. Right, I'm gonna stop the recording there. Juicy. And then we've got 10 minutes of, uh, of questions if you want to ask me some questions. I, I have not, not so much a question, so much as an observation Hit me. from my own experience. Um, the last sort of, I'd say maybe six weeks, I've been doing a huge amount of work on my feet like, yep. uh, at the beginning of my sessions, you know, holds, ISA holds, and then little reps afterwards. Uh, on like the outsides of my feet and that first couple of weeks the most horrific thing I've ever done my feet were in so much pain in the last week or so my squats everything I can I'm feeling such a massive difference and I I keep saying to myself is this purely just down to working so much on my feet which I've never done before I've never done that sort of work before on my feet and uh, I'm, you know, it, it's just opened my eyes massively to the importance of it for doing something as complex as a squash. So much depends on your feet. Yeah, it could be. Your foot is the gateway to force production and, and control, force transference and force absorption throughout the entire kinetic chain. And if your feet can spread to the ground a little better, uh, I mean, you're never going to get worse for it. Unless you've got some sort of medical problem, you're never going to get worse. Mm. And, you know, uh, having not worked in an office for the last year and a half, um, and not wearing heels every day, I think that's helped as well. Mm. Another question, man. Um, yeah. And I sort of wrote it in the other um, meeting, but I thought I'd bring it up. And something you mentioned during the squad in the sitting phase. Um, have you heard of Lombard's paradox? I think that's L O M B A R D S. What's it called? Sorry? Lombard, I think. L O M B A R D S. No, nah, Tom. Well, sort of, it's just something I just. I can't remember where I found it, but it must have been like somewhere and then I was, um, Googled it. And apparently it's a paradox where from rising to stand from a seated or squatting position, both the ham hamstrings and quads contract at the same time despite being antagonists to each other. Yeah, so that's, that's something you're sort of with the rec fan and the hammies. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's that was, successive induction, how they will work together to create 
stability at the hip and a three dimensional yeah. movement pattern. Yeah, that's so something I was going to bring up to you. It's like a two dimensional way of looking at movement. It doesn't exist. It's not how movement mm. Yeah, and they, um, yeah, they talk about the moment arm, the rep fan moment arm is greater over the knee than the hamstrings, and then just how it also plays into, yeah, efficient movement, especially in the gait cycle. Um, and the hip extension also has a passive stretch component to rec fan as well. So, and also to like the need... iliofemoral ligament. Yeah, yeah. And that was, um, I was meaning to bring it up like a oh, fucking while ago or whenever it was, but um, yeah, I just brought it up. You just, you just um, does my memory as soon as you brought up that um, part about the hip and hip flexion and the hammies and stuff. It was pretty cool. Yeah, it's a different way of looking at it. I mean, movement principles, they don't change, which is the beauty of them. Um, we just need to understand that when we can navigate the principles a lot better, that will actually dictate the way that we program and prescribe exercise. We'll start, pre we'll start prescribing movement as a corrective or as a, uh, as a functional remedy rather than just prescribing load. And we'll yep. see better results for it. Because if someone can move into a position better, they can express force more cleanly. They will be better at expressing and navigating the force under load as well because the nervous system has better inputs. Like Michelle was just saying, yep. using her feet a lot better in a squat. Squatting happens from the fucking feet, man. And when I'm, when I'm teaching people how to squat, yeah. I'm teaching them how to feel the floor with their feet, not focus on the bar. The bar's not going anywhere. Like, what could the bar possibly do? It just sits there. All you have to do yeah. is pull yourself into the floor and push it's how the body moves. Yeah, it's it's really cool. Like, um, like I was saying, I messaged you about just prescribing load and just thinking it'll cure everything, but then I think really diving into the movement part and being picky and try and nail down something once I've developed the skill set, obviously the um, be a game changer. Yeah, man. I, I can't, I can't recommend FMS and SFMA and FCS highly enough only because like, you know, there's, there's so many movement screens out there and I'm not beholden to any one. But the reason I like FMS is because it's super easy. It's all it does is it does exactly what it says on the box. It just screens movement. Can this person do it or can't they, if they can tick the box, if they can't, are they in pain? If they're not, make them better movers. If they are in pain, well, let's take them out of pain and make them move better and see if that improves their, their, movement, their movement competency. If they're in pain, you move them into the selective functional movement assessment. Can you provoke their pain? If you can, is it medical or mechanical pain? Well, go and assess it. I can't assess all of that, so I, I refer a lot of the time. But at least it dictates my referral. Am I going to send this person to a doctor or a sports physio or an osteo? If I can manage their mechanical pain and move them through an FMS and they're moving really well, I'm going to take them through a capacity screen and see how they can, what they can do with their body. And that gives me a shit ton of data. And then I go, great. Now let's just program. Let's just make you a better mover. Simple. Then we got, then we get locked out now. It's looking good to go. So yeah, it's going to kick me out as well. All right, guys. Good. For